Good morning, church. Wow. Welcome to First United Methodist Church. This is the last day of the year. If you're a first-time visitor with us, a special welcome. Uh, for those of you that don't know, know me, uh, my name is Mike McLaughlin. I'm a retired pastor out of this conference. And if you're wondering why I'm up here this morning and not Pastor Mel, uh, not only is today New Year's Eve, but it happens to be the fifth Sunday of December. And we have started a new tradition where we try to do something different on that fifth Sunday. And I think I can promise you something a little different today. So we'll see how that works out. Uh, before we get into that, though, uh, a quick reminder. Uh, please fill out our friendship card. Let us know you've been here this morning. And on the back, they do uh, offer opportunities to lift people up in prayer. So we will take those up during the very first hymn. So uh, you got a few minutes to take care of that. Let me open us up in prayer and then I'm gonna ask Paul to give us some announcements about what's going on in the church this morning and uh, opportunities for Christian fellowship and ministry. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come to your house to worship you. We ask that you bless us and send the Holy Spirit upon us that we can feel your presence within our souls, within our hearts, and within our minds. We ask that you continue to bless us as we go into this new year, and we ask that you lead us to be closer to you as we go into this new year. And we ask all of this in your son's precious name. Amen. Amen. Paul. Good morning. Good morning. I actually got quite a few announcements for you, so you better buckle up. <laughs> um, the first one is this afternoon from 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock, Pastor Mel is going to host an open house at the Parsonage. The address of the Parsonage is 3117 Trailer Boulevard. Um, just follow all the cars. You'll see it. Uh, for any of you that got pictures taken with Santa, uh, there are a bunch of pictures back here on the North X desk. Uh, come pick those up. As long as you're picking things up, if you have purchased some poinsettias, please grab those. There are, they're still out here on the poinsettia tree. Go ahead and grab those. Take those home with you this afternoon. Um, there was a, an email that came out to some of the members of the church that was from Pastor Mel, and it was asking members to go out and purchase a uh, gift card or gift cards. Um, if you received it, please delete it. We sent a couple of emails out to everybody. Um, this isn't the first time it's happened to us. Hopefully we've got some security things in place and it'll be the last time it happens, but you never know. Let me assure you, we will never communicate with the congregation this way. We will never ask you via text message to run and buy us uh, gift cards or send us money or anything like that. If you ever receive anything like that and it's at all questionable, please call the church and, and ask us. Um, if you got something like that, let us know that too, so that we can try to put a stop to those. Uh, Tuesday, Tuesday morning, over at First Learning Tree, we're making some changes over there, and because of an increased need, we're actually going to open up a new infant room over at First Learning Tree. So that means that we need to clear out one of the existing classrooms and move all of the new cribs into that classroom. And we're gonna need help with that. If you have some time Tuesday morning, come on down. You can meet us here. You can meet us over at First Learning Tree. That starts, what, about nine o'clock? About nine o'clock, uh, Tuesday morning. Um, choir. I know the choir and everybody else has asked me, uh, the choir will resume rehearsals on Wednesday and we will be up singing in front of the congregation next week. So for those of you who have thought, well, you know, choir sounds like kind of a cool thing, but I don't know if I can sing. Let me assure you, you can. 
And this is the perfect opportunity because nobody's seen this music except for Paul and I. So come on out, we'll teach it to you. We'll show you how to do it. It's a lot of fun. It's a great group of people and you'll be glad you came out. Wednesday, 6.30 in the choir room down at the end of this hall. Almost burned my finger. Um, <laughs> I believe, oh, you're not, oh, I see, I didn't write that one down. Is that Tuesday or Wednesday? Tuesday, Tuesday morning at eight o'clock, the United Methodist Men will be meeting for their monthly meeting. Really? Wow. 7.30 over in the bistro. The United Methodist men will be meeting. Hopefully somebody's made coffee and brought plenty of breakfast for everybody. It's their monthly meeting. And if you are a male and you're in the United Methodist Church, you're a member. So come on down. And that's everything, isn't it? All right. So with all that, let's go to our first song of the morning. Our song of praise is on page 254. Will you stand as you're able and let's sing together, We Three Kings. Oh. Uh -huh. 
be seated. Will you join me in this morning's call to worship? God created the heavens and the earth at the perfect time. God. God created man and woman at the perfect time. God chose to send his son at the perfect time. God's time is always perfect. Let us give praise to God for his perfect time. And now as our ushers come forward for this morning's offering, let's sing Give Thanks. Gracious Father, we thank you for all that you have blessed us with. We now ask that you receive this small blessing that we return to you so that you may expand your world. Let us go forth from this place knowing that you are in charge and that everything we have is because of you. In Christ's name, amen. Let us rise. Please be seated. We come to our time of prayer this morning, and as Pastor Mel mentions every week, I am glad this is a praying church. i uh, just so excited that we take our cares and our problems, our wants, our needs, and our joys to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we come to you this morning on this last day of a great year that you've given us. And we ask for these to be lifted up to you, Lord. We lift our petitions for Kathy, Trey, Ernest, 
Vonda, foster and adopted children, Brenda, Tony, and Robert. Lord, in your mercy. The Pfeiffer family, the Sample family, the Davis family, Nora, Kathy, and the Chapman family. Lord, in your mercy. For Helen, for Helen, for Robbie, who's in the Army. Lord, we ask that you watch over all our military personnel. Let them know that you are with them all the time and bring them home safe. Lord, in your mercy. For Jessica, James, Kyle, Katie, Chris, and a prayer for peace in the world, and pray that you can show us your way. Lord, in your mercy. We lift up Sue and Laura and Scarlett and Patricia, Jane and Jimmy, Joe, Sue, Colin, Nathan, and cancer treatment for a 40-year-old with a family. Lord, we ask that you be with those that are suffering from cancer and other diseases. May you be with them, give them comfort, and know that you are near. Lord, in your mercy. The family of Eva Honeycutt, the Chapman family, Sue, Barbara, Paula, Steve, David, Adlo, Paula, Mike, Jason, Deborah, and Sawyer. Lord, in your mercy. For Ted, for Robert, for Jacob, for veterans with PTSD, Lord, once again, be with our military personnel. Let them know that they are not forgotten. We lift up Cassie and Neva and Alan, Richard, Dennis, and Maggie, Arthur, Helen, and our castaway people, and that mission that we do over there as well. Lord, in your mercy. We lift up Trudy, Lewis, Art, Scott, and Dolores, Stan, Hayden, Pamela, Dana, Daisy, Millie, and Nemo. Lord, in your mercy. Brianna, Ann, Gay, and Donna, Phil, and Elaine, George, George, Gina, Bob, Rob, Jeannie, Jean, Phyllis, and thank you for a great anniversary celebration. Lord, we know that everything that comes upon us, you are in control of, and we ask that you celebrate with us as we end this year and begin a new year with your blessings covering us up and all around us. Lord, we knew, know that we are blessed and that you are with us and that you love us unconditionally. And now, with the confidence of your children, we lift up that prayer that your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, before I get started up here, I need to do a little survey first. So if you could tell me, how many of you have read the story of Jesus Christ in the Bible? It's one, two... Well, that, that's, better, that's better than a lot of places I've been to, I can tell you that. Well, if you've been listening to Pastor Mel up here for the last few weeks of Advent, you know that God chose a certain time and a certain place to send his son. Now, we know he chose about 2,000 years ago, and he chose the place of Israel. 
But have you ever wondered what would have happened if he had chosen a different time and a different place? I know I have. For example, what happens if he had decided to choose the time of now and the place of Texas? What would the story be like then? Would it be different? Would it be the same? What would that story be like? Well, like most great stories, it would start with a pretty girl. Now this girl's name is Mary Haywood, you know, from up in Abilene. Now, she was engaged to a man by the name of Joe Davidson. And before they were married and had sexual relations, Mary became pregnant. Now this upset Joe because he thought that Mary was a nice girl from a good Texas family and he was wondering how he would get his high school football jacket back from her. <laughs> now, he then fell into a deep sleep and an angel of the Lord came to him while he was sleeping. Joe Davidson, don't be afraid to marry Mary because she has been made pregnant by the Holy Spirit. She will have a child who you will name Jesus because he will deliver his people from their heirs. That's it. Marry the girl. Well, Joe did exactly like the angel instructed him. He did marry his girl and he decided to name the child Jesus. Of course, all the neighbors were totally confused because every other boy in the neighborhood was named Jesus. <laughs> well, shortly after the wedding, and when Mary was well into her ninth month, she and Joe had to go to Waco for an income tax audit. Now, while they were on their way, Mary let out a sound like Joe had never heard before in his life. They were about two miles outside of Nacogdoches, and so Joe pulled into the Lone Star Motor Inn, and he asked the people, where's the hospital? They said, <laughs> well, about that time, Mary had another series of contractions, and so because the inn was full, right after dark, Joe and the hotel manager broke down the door of a trailer out back, an abandoned trailer. They ran an extension cord out for a small space heater. They shooed away the mud daubers and they delivered the baby Jesus into the world. He was wrapped in a comforter and laid in an apple crate. First string reporters came from all over the country to interview locals who had witnessed the event. The New York Times talked to a cattle rancher. Yes, ma'am. I saw the whole thing. I just got the cows in for the night when I heard this music. La -dee -da -dee -da. I thought I was going to have me a heart attack. And then I heard somebody calling my name. Bubba. <laughs> I looked up and what I saw looked like a hundred sons. And they were singing a message just for me. The gist of which was, if you want to see a child born of God and a Texas girl, you better get on over to Nacogdoches. So I went. Well, at the time that Jesus was born, Herod was the governor of Texas. Now some scholars from the east came to Herod one day and they asked him where they could find the child that had been born to take his place. Now Herod pretended not to be shocked by such a question, and he sent the scholars on their way, hoping that they would return back to him with more information. Well, those scholars had no trouble finding where the baby Jesus was because a star they had seen in the Orient led them directly to where the baby laid. They knelt down 
and they opened the gifts that they had brought for him. A gold American Express card. <laughs> Some candles that smelled like fresh lotus blossoms and a very large, expensive looking bottle of Jade East. Now, during the midst of the celebrations, Joe was once again visited by one of God's messengers. Psst, Joe, take your wife and baby and highball it to Mexico. Because Herod's going to try to kill that baby. That's it. Get moving. Well, when the scholars did not return back to Herod, he decided to call a conference of his closest advisors. Oh, thank you, gentlemen. Everybody have a seat around here, would you please? Everybody sit down, sit down. Have any of you seen a National Enquirer article about a virgin birth? I understand this virgin baby is supposed to be the next governor. If that's true, I'd like to shake his hand. I'd like to shake it real good. <laughs> Do any of you know his whereabouts? Nacogdoches. <laughs> what makes you think he's a Nacogdoches? Well, it's all written in the Bible, Brother Herod. From you, Nacogdoches, in the state of Texas, are by no means the least of the Texas delegation. From you will come forth a governor who will wisely guide my chosen people. Thank you, Brother Lamar. Well, I think we need to celebrate this miraculous birth in our home state. So gentlemen, if you'll excuse me, I have a few plans to make to celebrate this. Thank you all, gentlemen. Sonny, could you stay behind for just a minute? Thank you all, gentlemen. Sonny, have a seat. Sonny, you know I can't compete with religious fanatics. And I think you and your boys down there in Nacogdoches owe me a favor or two. You help me nip this baby in the bud. Well... Secret patches were made and orders given, and unsuspecting children paid with their lives for political maneuvers. One more day, one Sunday morning, Herod had Sunday see to it that a bomb was thrown through the window of a nursery at a church where Jesus was supposed to be. But since Joe had taken Mary and the baby and gone to Mexico, the plan failed to kill him but the resulting explosion did murder 14 innocent infants and toddlers. It was a horrible sight that morning. And then the words of the prophet Jeremiah had new meaning. An explosion is heard in Nacogdoches. Great weeping and anguish. Rachel is crying for her children and there's no consoling her. She has lost them. Well, fortunately, not long after that, Herod did kick the bucket. And Job moved his family back into the town of Goliad. Now, every year, Mary and Joe would go to Houston for the Sunday School Teachers Conference. Well, when Jesus was about 12 years old, they took the whole family that year. And the crowds were four times as large that year because the national board had decided to hold the conference in a brand new civic center facility. And you know nothing excites Methodists more than a new building. <laughs> well, when the conference was over, Joe was trying to hustle the family into the car. Come on, come on, everybody get in the car. Get in, Mary, if you'll get in the back with the girls and the baby. Come on, Jimmy, Joe Jr., come on, get in the car. We got a five-hour drive ahead of us. Shoot, somebody been eating peanut butter and jelly in the car again. It's all over the steering wheel. 
Jesus, let me borrow your handkerchief so I can clean this mess up. I'm going to find out who, we, who did this before we get to Bucky's. Jesus, I said, let me... Wait a minute. What do you mean he's not here? Jesus? Jesus. What does that boy think he's got me into now? Jesus. Jesus. Oh, my. Dr. Troy. Dr. Troy, that was a fine week of preaching. You held us in the palm of your hand. Listen, I hate to run off, but we just lost our oldest. Oh, yes, sir, he knows his Bible backwards and forwards. I beg your pardon. He said, what? Jesus. Jesus. What Bible stories have you been telling, Dr. Troy? He tells me you're a fine young preacher. Oh, yes, sir, Dr. Troy. Jesus loves it at First Church Goliad. Jesus, don't you think our new minister is a fine man of God? I'm sure he did not mean that, Dr. Troy. <laughs> we'll see you next year. Jesus, sit down there. What do you think you're doing, running off like that, embarrassing your daddy? What do you have to say for yourself? Son, I had to be about my father's business. Joe. You see, Joe didn't always catch on just like that. Well, Jesus grew up to be a fine young man. He was intelligent and God liked him. Now, Jesus had a cousin, JB. It was a little odd. He dressed funny and he ate strange stuff. But J.B. was a good man of God, and he was out in the wilderness teaching and preaching and baptizing people. So Jesus went to see him and got himself baptized by him. Then he went out to the desert of West Texas for 40 days and 40 nights for some tests. Now, he had nothing to eat and nothing to drink, so he was very hungry. And this was an opportunity for the devil to tempt him. The devil came to him after he was very, very hungry, and he said, if you truly are the Son of God, then you can change these stones into hush puppies. <laughs> but Jesus said, man doesn't live by hush puppies alone. There was two more tests that Jesus passed with no problem at all. Then when he got back home, he decided it truly was time to be about his father's business. Now, he'd already had a couple of jobs. He worked with Joe for a while as a carpenter. He had a brief stint as a bartender. Oh, yeah, he had a water-based wine cooler that was the talk of the town. Well, Jesus decided that if he was going to change the world, that he should get some men to help him. Well, one day when he was walking along the Sabine River, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was nicknamed Rock, and his brother Andy out in their boat fishing for widemouth bass because they were professional fishermen. Jesus walked up to the shoreline and he said to them, Y'all! Cast your line with your left hand, and you'll pull in a big one. Oh, Andy, no wonder we haven't caught any fish all night long. Because we have made this stupid assumption that merely because we are right-handed people, that we should cast with our right hands. Oh my, how dumb we have been. It's just what I need, some turkey telling me how to fish. Okay, Buster, this one's for you. Can you believe that? I think I got one. 
a Rock and Andy were hooked on Jesus and they walked with him. And then Jesus got the Zebedee boys and he got Nat and Phil from up around College Station. We thought they were royalty because they were all dressed in purple and white. It was about that time that Jesus met me, Matthew, at the IRS office. Matthew, do you like this kind of work? Sorry. 451-632891. No, 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 no payment was necessary this year. No. No, it, it, it wasn't under any level. It just wasn't. How do I get by? Well, people are real nice to me and my followers. Well, let me explain. You see, I tell people about my father and make them well. And they do nice things for us. We have a wonderful time. No, I didn't go to med school. I tell people about my father and he makes them well. My father? God. Now, don't get so excited. Matthew, if, you, if you'll just calm down. Matthew, live my life. <laughs> well, Matthew was sold on Jesus, and then he got Tad and Jim Alphelia. And then he got Tom and Simon the rebel. And pretty soon, we had 11 of us. But Jesus said we needed 12. So he got Judd. Well, we went all over East Texas, spreading Jesus' message to every small town that we came to. It didn't make any difference who it was, where it was, or what time it was. We told them Jesus' message. Now, Jesus taught by telling stories. I remember one time he told a story that went like this. Once upon a time, there was an insurance salesman on his way to Dallas when he ran out of gas. So he pulled over to the side of the interstate and he flagged down the first car to come along. Unfortunately, it was a stolen one filled with a gang of hoods. They robbed him, stabbed him, and left him on the side of the highway for dead. Well, the very next car to come along was driven by the president of a very large southern denomination. <laughs> when he saw the man lying there, he said, Oh, thank you, Lord, that in your sovereignty you have seen fit to appoint the Texas Rangers to deal with situations like this. And he got in his car and he left. Well, the very next car to come along was driven by the United Methodist District Superintendent. She's not here, is she? <laughs> just, just checking. Well, when she saw the man lying in the ditch, she said to herself, Oh my, I had no idea that the crime rate on the road to Dallas was this bad. When I get back to San Antonio, I'm going to ask the bishop to convene an inquiry about what we can do about the crime. Well, just minutes before the poor man bled to death, along the road comes this illegal Mexican driving his old beat-up pickup truck. He stopped, got out, picked the man up, wrapped him in a blanket, and took him off to the hospital. Now, you remember this story and treat everybody on this planet like you would want everybody on this planet to treat you. In a nutshell, that's everything I've got to say. Well, Jesus not only told stories. He did miracles. He healed people. The sick, the lame, the blind. He even raised people, you won't believe this, but he raised people from the dead. I, 
I remember one time he took five boxes of Nabisco's, two cans of sardines, and he fed 5,000 people. <laughs> well, pretty soon the job got so massive that Jesus decided to train some of us. So we learned everything we thought we needed to know. But Jesus told us we weren't going to be some nickel and dime rinky din carnival show. We were going to take his message all the way to the capital of Austin. But Jesus also told us that when we got to Austin, his enemies would see to it that he was arrested, taken to Huntsville, and executed. We had no idea what he was talking about, especially when he said, I'm going to give my enemies three days to dance all over my grave, and then I shall return. All we know is we were getting to go to Austin. We were stoked up. We were excited. We were ready. Turned out we weren't ready. We failed the very first test that Jesus gave us, a simple demon exorcism. Well, Jesus said why he went to South Potter Island for a private prayer session, that we should go back to Goliad for a little bit more training. So on the way back to Goliad, we decided we'd stop off at Lake Somerville for a little fishing trip. We were out fishing, and it was a beautiful day, and then suddenly the sky turned yellow, and a tornado started. The winds picked up, waves were lapping at our beach. We thought we were goners. And then, just like that, the sky turned as blue as the morning glory. The winds and the waves died down. Rock said, I swear, that's the biggest fit duck I've ever seen in my life. It's me, Jesus. Come on, Rock, you can do this if you want to. Look, no skis. Well, of course it's crazy. Come on, do it. Get your other foot. Get your other foot out of the boat. That's it. Take a little step. Oh, Mark, Rock, that's marvelous. That's wonderful. That's drowning. <laughs> when Rock sank, Jesus looked so dejected that I think he was beginning to wonder if he'd made a mistake about what he was doing and even who he was. In fact, just a couple of days later, he came by our room and he asked us, boys, last night in a newspaper article, I saw this article by a reporter that said, I'm not really Jesus, that I'm probably Jeremiah. This morning on a TV talk show, I heard this Bible scholar saying that I was Moses. I almost believed him. But that got me to wondering, who do you say that I am? Rock, don't look at your notes. You know this. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Who do you say I am? Oh, that's easy. Who do you say I am? We talked about this, didn't we? Who do you say? I've almost got it. Who do you... Well, of course, you are the Lord's man. You are the Son of God. Simon Rock Johnson put it there. You are wonderful. I am going to give you the keys to my Father's kingdom. Now you remember that when they take me to Huntsville to be executed. I'm sorry, Jesus, but you got to stop all this execution talk. We got your whole plan, your whole takeover planned out. Matt's going to organize us into a nonprofit corporation. And Andy had an old friend from high school who's made it big out in Hollywood. And he's going to do a TV special just about you. And Tad is going to organize people to elect officials who will support your 
world peace plan when they're elected into office. Isn't that something, Jesus? Speak to me. You don't seem too keen on all this. I didn't come to star on some TV show. And I didn't come to lead some corporation or lead the world's peace movement. I came to separate a bride from her husband. I came to separate a son from his daddy or a sister from her sister. Anybody that puts their parents and their children above me is not my man. Anybody that puts their possessions ahead of me is not my man. And anybody who won't accept their own execution is not my man. Well, get out of here, Satan. Well, none of us could even look Jesus in the face after that. But the very next morning, he burst into our room and told us we were shooting on down to Austin. He borrowed an old school bus. We loaded up and headed down the highway. Pretty soon, other cars and pickup trucks fell in along with us until we had a convoy. Other people were seeing us coming. They were taking off their coats, laying them down on the highway to make a carpet for us. Other people were cutting off cactus blooms and Indian paintbrushes, throwing them into the air. People were cheering, hooray for our leader, hooray for God's man, hooray for God Almighty. By the time we got into the city, the whole city was stoked up. Huge crowds gathered. We stopped at first church. People were in a frenzy, expecting Jesus to do miracles, produce money out of thin air, and announce his takeover of the government. Instead, he went across the street to a construction site. He borrowed a sledgehammer and headed into the church. When he got to the center mall, there was an overpriced display of artifacts and gifts that Jesus started to smash to smithereens. He then headed down to the offices, broke down the door, he threw out the finance committee, burned the investment and endowment records, and scrapped the long-range expansion plans. About that time, the clerks and the shop owners tried to flee, but the minister of education had thrown a burglar alarm, and that burglar alarm locked all the doors of the church trapping the ministerial staff in their own fellowship hall. It did not take Jesus long to find them. You, sons of snakes, my house shall be known for its commitment to God Almighty. And you've changed it into a banker's club and a religious racket. About that time, the young people and the poor people and the ill people started to come into the church. And Jesus said, come to me, all of you who have had a belly full of emptiness. Get in the harness with me, because my harness is practical. And my assignment is joy. Well, the people on the outside almost broke into a riot waiting for Jesus to come out and lead an attack on the government offices. When he did not, the same people that just hours before had been cheering him turned against him and joined the factions against him, calling him a fake and a fraud. We were lucky to escape out the back of the church. A few nights later, when we were going to dinner, I heard Jesus say to Judd, don't you have some new friends you need to go meet? Well, when dinner was almost over, Jesus took a biscuit, tore it in half, and said to us, you all better bite into this. It's my body. You all better swallow this. It's my blood. 
Once again, we had no idea what Jesus was talking about, but he seemed so sad at the time that we did it. After dinner, we went out to a rock garden behind the restaurant, and Jesus said to us, Jim, John, Rock, I'm so glad that you're here with me. No, everything's not all right. It's true, like it says in the Bible. He shall be thrown in with the vicious. If you'll give me just a minute. Oh, Father, please ex release me from this agony that I'm experiencing. But I don't want you to do anything that you don't want to do. Okay, Father, I will. Oh, oh, oh it's you, Judd. Who's all your friends? Judd, did you just kiss the Son of Man? Oh, buddy, do you know what you've started? They arrested Jesus on the spot. And after a mock trial, he was taken to Huntsville. On Sunday, we got the bad news. Jesus had been executed. But in addition, they mocked him and they tortured him. But I heard that even throughout all of that, Jesus asked God to forgive those people. Well, a rich, well-to-do citizen from up around Ron Rock went to the new governor, Pilate, and asked for permission to take the body. He had an undertaker friend of his wrap the body up and place it in his family tomb. He then placed a large granite slab in front of that tomb. Now, Pilate, to make sure there was no shenanigans going on, had the highway patrol, the Texas Guard, and the Texas Rangers guard that tomb. We thought we had seen the last of Jesus. Well, on a Sunday morning, some commotion started. Mary from up around Uvalde and the other Mary and Joanna went to that tomb to place some flowers beside it when suddenly an angel come flying out of the sky. He zipped past the police helicopter, smashed that granite slab to pieces, and he told the ladies, I know you came here to see Jesus, but he's not here. He's back from the dead. You go back and tell your friends what you've seen here today. Well, they took out of there like three long-tailed cats and a room full of rocking chairs. And whom do they meet on the way except Jesus himself? And he said, Howdy, ladies. Y'all stop being so scared. You go back and you tell my brothers and sisters that I will meet them on that mountain in New Mexico. Well, that night at the Lone Star Barbecue, Jesus nearly gave everybody a cardiac arrest when he walked through the doors, and I mean through the doors. But he ordered a big piece of pecan pine, a Dr. Pepper, ate it right in front of everybody, and that put their doubts aside. Well, Jesus did keep his promise. He met us on that mountain in New Mexico, and he said to us, It worked. God's plan worked. And all power on heaven and earth has been given to me. And I pass it right on back to you. You go out into this world and make new disciples of God's world. Inviting all people, all races, into my Father's family. And I'll be with you right up to the last inning. Amen. A few things I, I hope through all the silliness that you discover today. 
First of all, God did choose a couple of thousand years ago, and he did choose the place of Israel, and it was perfect. But God could have chosen now, and he could have chosen Texas, and it would have been perfect. In fact, God could have chosen any place and any time, and it would have been perfect. Because God is perfect. And friends, you and I are made in God's image, so we can obtain that perfection as well. And why is that? Because no matter where God chose, no matter what time God chose, a few facts would be true. Jesus would be Lord and Master, Savior, and be seated at the right hand of God the Father. And through His acts, no matter where they were or what time they were, you and I would be redeemed of our sins and have that promise of a heavenly banquet for all eternity. And Jesus' promise of sending the Holy Spirit to guide us as we walk this earthly past, spiritual passage. How great that story is, regardless of when God chose to send His Son or where He chose to send His Son. Amen, my friends. I'll invite our musicians back up, and we will sing our song of commitment this morning, Go Tell It on a Mountain, which seems appropriate, because that's where we left Jesus. Just a couple of quick reminders, please don't forget, Pastor Mel is inviting us all to the parsonage two to five this evening, or this afternoon. So it's a come and go, so uh, please respond to that. See what we've done with the parsonage since the last time you were out there as well. Uh, don't forget, First Learning Tree needs help Tuesday morning, so let's respond to that as well. Uh, one last thing, as you know, uh, a few weeks ago I talked to you about the opportunities for mission trip to Guam for um, 
opportunity to help with hurricane recovery. Um, I leave this Wednesday to go back to Guam and because I'm part of the leadership team, I'll be gone for a month. So I won't see you guys for a while. Keep me in your prayers and my team as well, if you would, please. Let us go forth from this place today with God's grace and mercy and the love of Jesus Christ. We ask that you go into this new world, into this new year, with new hope for new beginnings. In Christ's name, amen. amen.